Short pre-roll, folks. Steve Burkholder is in the house. This is going to be his kickoff episode for taking over the duties on the mic for the truth. So you recently saw Steve on the live feed for the UKC's Tournament of Champions. He did an outstanding job. It's obvious that this guy knows coon hunting, competition coon hounds inside and out. He has been competing for a long time. He's got one dog in the Hall of Fame, Blue Tech Hall of Fame, and that is uh, his group junior dog. So he has got some experience to share with you. And in this episode, you're going to hear some things about his past that you may not have known and you're going to laugh about a lot of this stuff too he's super high energy very entertaining you're going to love it we got a great episode queued up for you it's ready to roll the old south dog box is rocking let's dump the box all right welcome to the truth everybody on the houndsman xp podcast network and this is the big announcement that we've been waiting for and uh we got Steve Burkholder taking over the duties for this episode on the truth. It's going to be coming out. I don't know how often. How often do you think you're going to produce these? Well, I uh, uh, I'm really excited about it. I would like to build it obviously to where we have a weekly show. That's kind of what uh, uh, our overall game plan is to have a weekly episode. That's good news for me, and Absolutely. I think our listeners are going to like that too. Well, it's uh, it's something that I've, as you know, I've looked forward to uh, for a while, and uh, but there was just some things that had come in the way that kind of prevented that for the last couple of years, and the opportunities, you know, has come open, and uh, it's going to afford me the time to do it. So I'm really excited about it. So what we're doing here is we are recording on your new recorder. So this is kind of a learning process, and we're going to talk about things like nose breathing into the mic how that's not not kosher uh we're going to talk about you know that that's not kosher you know thumping on tables but really what we're going to do is we're going to we're going to talk about our lives as coon hunters and competition coon hunting the things that we've done over the years and uh, kind of introduce our guests because josh has done a great job with the podcast and things like that but he's moving on with some other stuff and we're bringing it we're not going to stop we're not going to stop telling the truth about competition, coon hunting, and coon hunting in general. It's not all going to be competition, is it? No, I uh, uh, actually probably to even expound more than that is uh, you know we've done I've done different types of hunting in in, in my lifetime uh, with hounds, mm -hmm. uh, dogs in general. Uh, always been fascinated uh, with that side of it from young on up. So. Uh, yeah, we're going to. Uh, it, it's going to have a. It's going to have some competition uh, stuff, but it's going to have a lot of, uh, you know, the beginnings of a lot of people. Uh, and you know, I share with people all the time. Most of us uh, was pleasure hunters, I guess you could call it. Uh, we're just hunters. We're just hunters. Yeah. Uh, long before uh, competition was ever introduced, and uh, you know, I'm probably excited about that because honestly. Um, you know, when, when when you approached me about doing the Truth Series, it's such an awesome title because that's what our hope is, is to, to bring out the truth. And a lot of it is going to have to do with what happened before uh, somebody actually got introduced to uh, competition and that side of it. I know for me, I hunted several years before I ever competed. And some people have ran a career as a competition coon hunter, you know, in different registries and stuff like that. And... You know, they just either lost interest, and but they're still hunting with hounds. And those are good stories, too. You know, some of the most legendary people in these breed organizations and the different breeds aren't even in competition coon hunting now. They may have somebody running a dog for them and things like that. They've got a lot of experience, but maybe they decided they wanted to be a breeder or they wanted to be a trainer or they wanted to be the guy that could start pups for people that wanted to duke it out in a in a competition coon hunt absolutely and you know something that i've noticed over the years most of your uh most of your good trainers i guess you could say you know we talked many years on you know some people are just dog men uh they can take they can take a dog they can look at a dog hunt with them one or two nights and this dog may be subpar in some people's hands but they can take that dog and do six months work with it and uh, the dog becomes a totally different dog. And what you'll notice over the years, what I've noticed is, is once 
someone takes a dog like like a, a true trainer once someone takes a dog like that and it gets to where it's doing it consistently or whatever they're usually looking for a new dog to do the same thing with so mm -hmm. you know not saying that some of them don't compete them uh, compete with them but you know that's really not what makes them tick as per to say so they kind of get bored with them because they want to start out with something new because they're just they're a dog person and i think you know if you look in today's age you know let me talk let me talk about that real quick if i can you know some people just um they fit a certain mold they 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 like starting dogs they like getting to that that stage where they think that they can compete but they have no desire to go do that or they may start them out on their competition competition journey and then decide that somebody will offer money for it somebody that's a good handler but they're also a hard hunter and a good dog man is doug bub blackwell you know i mean that guy hunts hard every night yeah he gets these dogs to a certain stage and he sells them and then sometimes he regrets it and he buys them back Oh, yeah. But but Doug's a, a good handler, but he's also I, I would classify somebody like Bub as being a, a good hard hunter that knows how to train a dog. He do, he's done it with many different dogs. Yeah, you know, and there and there's still you know there's still a lot of that out there. You know, I think you know there's a lot of dogs too, and I know this may be a little controversial, but you know there's a lot of dogs that get into I guess you could say a so-called competition hunter's hands and uh in five or six months i'm not saying that the dog has uh blowed up i guess the term that you could use but uh more so that may not be operating like he was when they first bought him mm -hmm. and uh, i think that goes right back to you know a lot of your you know you know for me coming up to you know i guess the ranks i guess you could say uh, being a pleasure hunter for so many years before I ever uh, did competition hunting and, and being raised, you know, we didn't have a lot of extra money to spend. Uh, we had to make what we had. Uh, you know, for me to be able to go out uh, in the early years for several years and try to buy one already made. No way. Wasn't going to happen. Yeah, you know, I, I, I remember I remember vividly uh, uh, trying to, uh, you know, when I, first, uh, when I got my first uh, coon dog, it wasn't even a really coon. It was a half coon dog, half beagle. And it never treated a coon. I mean, it didn't even well, really go hunting. Okay, so it so wasn't a coon dog. It was. It was. It was the best thing. It was a dog that you took coon hunting. <laughs> exactly, hundred <laughs> percent. But it was. It was. I don't know if I recall. I think I spent fifteen or twenty dollars, uh, and and worked hard for you know three or four months to even come up with that. And uh, but you know what? It was my first one, and that was just where I was at. And uh, of course, I was young. I was you know a uh, young man then, probably. I don't know, probably 10 or 11, maybe yeah. nine or 10. Well, going back to that, that deal about, you know, competition handlers, getting these dogs and then blowing them up in five or six months. I think there's a big myth out this. This is a truth part of it where something that I've seen over the years, not everybody is going to be, uh, you know, that, that guy that can go into a situation and handle a dog to a world championship. We all think we can, we all want to believe that we can, but there are certain people that are very talented that can do that. I look at it like the Kentucky Derby. You know, the guy that's on the back of the horse during the race isn't the trainer. He's not the owner. He's a guy that can stay on a horse, and he knows how to put that horse in a position to win on game day. And, and there are certain people in our, in our sport of coon hunting that know how to do that. Um, and then there are certain people that are just really good trainers. And I think too many times we all decide that we need to be everything. Right. And instead of, and our egos get in the way, it's like, oh, I can train a young dog. Well, no, you can't, you know? So I think we're missing that part of it. And for me, the best thing that I ever did as a hunter was realized that I can win in competition. I know how to do it, but I don't enjoy it. I don't enjoy going and competing with my hounds. I have a better time getting those dogs started. I love taking those pups and seeing them develop and recognizing those and then getting them to a certain point and then passing them on to people that can be successful with them. Right. Well, you know, Chris, that may have to do some with your age. I mean, because uh, let's face it. <laughs> but I didn't enjoy it when of, I, I Right. But, you know, I think as a person gets older, uh, I know for me, uh, I'm 49 years old now. 
and uh, have been competitive all my life in anything mm-hmm. that I've done. Uh, but, you know, I enjoy uh, pleasure hunting now as much that side of it as I do the competition mm-hmm. side. Uh, don't get me wrong. I, I still enjoy competition hunting and will to and will do that, continue to do that until I feel like, you know, uh, I'm at that point where, you know, face it, at, you know, you're not going to be as sharp. You're not going to hear as good. You're not going to react as good as, as somebody, you know, the, you know, with the hunts that we have today, uh, people, you know, there's, there's a, there's a big hunt almost every weekend. And if I go yeah. once every two or three months versus a guy that's going once every weekend or three times a month or three times a month, it's naturally, they're going to react quicker in, in situations because they're in them situations all the time. But you know, back to your point where you had said about the where you used the the derby analogy on that, yeah. which is a great analogy because, you know, in just just this past week, obviously we know that Pro Sport had their hundred thousand dollar hunt, and uh, that was obviously won by a dog named Echo. Yeah, that's owned by Randy Morgan and Scott Engel, and uh, you know, uh, knowing that situation. Probably a lot of people don't know the backdrop on that. They open up the magazine, and, and I mean, this dog's won it's in, in like six months, seven months or something like that. It's won right at $279,000, which is just incredible. Going back as little as 10 years or or, or so ago, there was just a, a couple dogs that have won 100000 exactly. lifetime. And yes. he's done this in like seven months. So it shows where that side of it's come to. But the backdrop on that that a lot of people probably don't know. Uh, obviously, Scott's a family man. His kids are both in sports. Um, he's got a lot going on. They, they, you know, they also show pigs and that kind of thing. And um, quit kicking at, the table. I know, he actually come up, <laughs> Ricky but, Podcaster. Right, but uh, uh, really, what's interesting about that? And to your point, uh, Scott knew that he couldn't hunt the dog enough to get him ready, mm-hmm. so he sent him to Randy. Now you'll see Randy hunt a hunt every now and then. But Randy Morgan is one of the I. He's a coon hunter. Uh, yeah. he, if if the competition hunts stopped today, Randy Morgan would be one of them guys uh, that would still hunt every night. And uh, you know he got Echo uh, two or three weeks. I, I don't know all the particulars, but I know he had him at least a couple weeks before this hunt, mm-hmm. and just flat out hunted him and got him ready for that hunt. And uh, you know, so again. He he enjoys that side of it. He's he, I guess you could kind of use that analogy, and he knows how to get one right because he's. I mean, his track record speaks for himself. He'll compete in a hunt every now and then, but I've talked to Randy personally. He he would much rather let that up to Scott. Let Scott go do the uh, competitive side or whatever, and uh, although he's there and a part of it and walks along or whatever, he just he just loves hunting, you know, we, and we he knows that, how to get one right. We did that with Big Country. Oh yeah, you know, the three of us. We, uh, you know, we got him to the point. I was handling him some most of the time. Donnie was handling him, you know, in a few hunts when he first started. Uh, Donnie's one of those guys. He just doesn't enjoy the competition hunting. But we got him to that point and realized that we needed somebody else to come in, and that's when you came in on that. And you would hunt him, and you'd we'd run him, but when he needed a break, bring him off the road. Don, we'd bring him back down, and Donnie would get him all screwed up. And well, then he, you'd have to take him back and get his mind right again. Oh yeah. Well, you know, <laughs> he uh, uh, he was one of them dogs where, and hey, every dog is different. But he was one of them dogs. If he knew he could get away with it, he would. Yeah. And he loved every minute of it. You know. But it was good. It was good for him to do that. To sometimes just let him do that because, you know, I think that um, you know every dog is different. I, I think in today's world, uh, your best trainer, your best dog men, uh, they know what buttons to push, how to get one right. Yeah. You know, so many times... They know when to apply pressure and then back off the pressure. Exactly. And and, and also, you know, uh, dogs are like, you know, you can raise... You've got three children. I guarantee you all three of your children uh, reacted differently to different things in life growing up. They all had different personalities. Right. And dogs are the same way. And I I think one of the biggest things that people struggle with, uh, especially... Uh, young people that are young trainer, or I guess you know people that are making dogs or whatever, they they may hunt three or four or five, and then <clears throat> all of a sudden they get a good one, and you know so when they get that good one, they think that that training technique is going to work on for everyone that they get from that point forward. Yeah, and I've seen it over and over and over again. They attri- they uh, try to apply that same pressure to every dog that they get, mm-hmm. 
And in three or four months, that dog comes up on the auction block and it's gone. Right. And somebody else can take that dog. Echo's a prime example. You know, some dogs' personalities just don't fit with the guy that's behind him. Right. And, uh, you know, Echo had, uh, you know, I think uh, Doug uh, Jackson hunted him for a while. And uh, I know Kevin Cable hunted him for a while. And then Scott Engel gets him. And it's not, it's not that Doug ja- I mean, Doug Jackson's record speaks for himself. That guy's been doing this here for many and won a bunch. Kevin Cable, obviously, you can't take away from anything that he's done. I mean, look at, I mean, he, he's brought out many, many winners. But some dogs just click with people. Right. You know, and, and sometimes, you know, when them personalities don't jive or whatever, uh, it's happened to me personally. I, I've, I've sold in, in, uh, practically give away, uh, some ones that was good ones that just for me, they wasn't going to suit me. They didn't like me and I didn't like them. I guess you could say. I think when we were younger and we did, you know, going back to those days when we didn't have a lot of money and things, then we stuck it out a little longer with some of these dogs. Cause we didn't have no choice. Yeah. We didn't have any choice. <laughs> And but now the way it is, I think a lot of us we we look for dogs. When we look at a dog, we're like, man, I like that. I like that. I like that. I can deal with this, or I can correct it. But I like that. So we find dogs that we're comfortable with. And you take, like, I'm hunting. What is it? Third generation off a of country now, and I see things in those pups that I know I can work with. It's not saying that I couldn't go get another dog from another line. And I mean, I got that crazy Yog Terrier right now. He's going to be a whole different experiment for me. But um, I think as trainers, a lot of times we get comfortable with our training techniques and we find dogs that we know can handle our skill set in the training part of it. Right. You know, I think that, um, well, you know, and this is another whole topic uh, to the point on country, you know, very few stud dogs uh, are, you know, or what so-called stud dogs are dominant reproducers. Mm-hmm. I mean, let's face it. I mean, if it, I mean, we, we can go through the history, and it's just the way it is. There's a lot of stud dogs out there that reproduce nice hounds, but very few of them uh, mark their pups. Oh my god! You know, I know um, where you're going. You know, on that side of it, and uh, not saying that some of them don't produce nice dogs, but. There's characteristics that some of them that they just mark their pups. You just know when you're sitting there hunting. You can watch a that, video. You can watch a video of them on Facebook and pick them out. Exactly. You know, what's that dog out of? You already know. As soon yeah. as it comes back, boom! You you're like, yep, I knew it. I knew that's what that dog was right. out of. And so, but you know, I think in the uh, in the breeding side of thing, it's always going to be a mystery. Uh, um, as far as I mean, you can line the stars up and stuff, and uh, you know, again. I can tell you, uh, you know, everybody's philosophy is different on that. Mm -hmm. Um, I think a lot of, you know, me personally, you know, uh, and again, uh, not to go down this trail here, but this is, again, just my opinion. That's why we call it the truth of series. You know, some people probably disagree. Well, your opinion isn't necessarily the truth, though. (laughs) Well, (laughs) it's not not, absolute. Exactly. But... I think I'll you, tell you what the truth is about opinions. Everybody's got one. <laughs> Everybody's got yeah. one. That's right. You know, I think if you go back in the history, and I've said this, and in in, in people have, uh, you know, kind of debated this side of it. You know, before DNA was enacted, you know, um, and again, uh, there was a lot of papers that was correct. But we we can sit here and we know and understand that there was quite a few papers that wasn't. And uh, way to know, start off your first podcast. I, just, I, just start butchering I, that sacred cow right now. <laughs> that's all right. We we just put it out there. Now I'm not going to go down that, that side of it. But what I will tell you, you're not going to name names. No, and it, <laughs> obviously. But but we my could. point my point is is when the DNA come out, um, you know that really kind of it now become real real. And I do believe personally. Years ago, we didn't have a lot of the health issues that we fight today. Um, and uh, I do think personally, if you purify something too much, um, you can take and it, 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 you go back through the history of cattle, you go back through the history of, of, of you know, swine, uh, goat, sheep, and all that. And uh, there's a reason why in the past 20 years uh, that they've went to some of the crossbreeding. Because what they figured out, if you do the research on it, what they figured out statistically 
You take a cow, for instance. I grew up on a dairy farm. Mm -hmm. uh, you take, you know, the reason that they're crossbred because it's not as much. I mean, obviously, you put that hybrid in there, first off. But the second thing is, is their immune system becomes stronger. And right. so what they're doing, wh why are they gaining more weight for, for the amount of feed that's being fed to them, which is where the profit is at? is because they're not constantly treating them for being sick. They're not constantly fighting some kind of a health issue. And, uh, you know, we can, either, we can either live under a rock or just come out and say it, you know, just how it is. A lot of these dogs today, um, when they start not looking good, the first thing that people think, well, i got to hunt them harder or, you know, I'm going to teach them a thing or two and that kind of thing. And the very first thing that we should do is, are they completely 100% healthy? Because mm -hmm. uh, most of the time, not always, but most of the time, if you start with the health side of that dog, you know, what he's being fed, uh, how he's being taken care of, most of the time you can eliminate uh, why the dog's maybe not looking as sharp. And then some dogs, hey, some dogs look better when the green's off, some dogs look better when the green's on. And if you know, if you follow some of these dogs uh, of guys that consistently win and, and compete with these dogs for four or five years, and that dog is, you know, becomes consistently year after year in a winner's circle, and they can compete with it for five or six years, it's because that guy has figured out what makes that dog tick and not push it beyond the, you know, that side but, of but it. But the thing about that, though, with Steve, I've said it before, and I'll say it on a podcast, looking at the track record, looking at the win and loss record does not necessarily translate to me that it's a dog that I want to hunt. Because there, is, there are so many variables in that. Uh, you know, who's trained that dog? And just because a dog wins and he's been trained to win doesn't necessarily mean that he's passing on any skills genetically um, for, for just a pure coon dog. It's, it's not the, the catalyst that, that we should be gauging. He, can't, he cannot pass on his trainability to accomplish something. You know, when I'm looking for that dog that's a great dog, then I want to see him outside of competition. I want to go hunt with him, and I want to watch him and see him and see how he not, – not what he accomplishes every – I think it's a mistake when we look at, at these dogs and look at win records and say, yeah, that's a dog I want to breed to. Well, again, Chris, it goes back to, you know, the technology that we have today versus what we had 20 years ago, even in the last 20 years. I mean, when they come out with the Garmin's and then they had, you know, now – you know, you have bird's eye. I mean, you can, you know, you have, you know, they have training, you know, they have training collars, you know, that are on, on these things and lighted collars. You know, again, let's go back 30 years on these hounds. Mm -hmm. They was, every one of them was natural pack hounds. Today in a hunt, uh, you don't hardly ever pull the same dog off of the same tree. Mm-hmm. And, uh, and, and, you know, again, this is just because I've watched this firsthand in the last 30 years uh, from some very prominent winners, okay, many prominent winners. They didn't start out, when you first started hunting them, they didn't start out being by themselves every time, mm -hmm. okay? Now, again, the hunts, the style, the way, the, what we do today, uh, they're set up. You need to be, you know, you need to... Uh, big share you're going to have a lot better shot at winning cast by being by yourself that's how that's just how the rules are that's how the hunts are but so so when when people look at that to your point when people look at that hound okay even when you go pleasure hunting with that dog after he's trained i guess you could call it um, you would almost have to go back to when he started as a puppy exactly and watch that progression you know, I've always shared this. I mean, with the technology that we have today and being able to hunt with dogs that are naturally are going to be by themselves, you know, once they're trained, I mm -hmm. guess you could call it. Um, and you start putting that young dog in that environment. If you give me a dog uh, that's got the mouth and the motor, he's got to have the one. They got to have the desire. You can't put desire in a hound. Right. But if they have that desire and they have brains we call it drive on the podcast drive. okay so there you go i'll get politically correct um, <laughs> if they have to first have drive you can't put that in them and then they got to have some kind of brains you can you can take a dog if you're a dog man you can take that dog and almost make a machine a machine train and be a machine mm -hmm. and because of the technology that we have i mean you know so when you start breeding these dogs they're going to reproduce 
what they was or what they are, but naturally, naturally, that's naturally, it. that's what's going to come. So when you look at that dog and you may hunt with him a hunt and say, my goodness, that thing, I'm, you know, and then you raise a litter of pups out of this dog and you're like, man, he ain't nothing like he's that. Well, he probably is a little bit more like the Siren Dam. It's just by the time you got to him and looked at him, right. they was made what they are. You yeah. know, again, I personally believe, you know, when somebody tells me that they have a dead loner natural from the start, there's very, very rare that that is because let's face it, guys. Go back in the history. If if you bred the same cross as the next six years, stop pounding on the table. and and took and <laughs> <laughs> and took and and threw the shot collar away, and didn't get on them if they come into a tree or they treat together or whatever. In five years, ninety percent of these hunts that we would go to, and this is again just my belief, would be back to where what it was twenty five years ago. Well, twenty five years ago it was a gunfight. I mean, it's a quick draw contest, is what it was. And it everything, wasn't, everything and it, was packed up together. And whoever was could call the dog the fastest was the one that ended up with the tree points, you know, and then everybody fell in line. There wasn't, I don't know when PKCs even tightened up their countdowns since 25 years ago, UKCs moving to it. Um, but it was a gunfight. It was a gunslinger contest is what it was. And, and it was a calling would, contest. People would pitch on your dogs, you know, you would, you would have a dog with a very distinct locate, and the last three trees, their dog was there too, or your, they were treed together. Man, you knew that your dog was going to be there. So when you heard that distinct locate, man, you're putting them on the card. And by the time you get the words out of your mouth, then your dog starts treeing. Yeah. You know, so that's where a lot of the, the disadvantage was. And that's why we pushed. If my dog's over here, independence, if my dog's over here and your dog's over here, you can't pitch on him. So kudos to the handlers for figuring that out but i do think there are some dogs that are naturally independent and we have had people that have have seen that and they want to duplicate that because they know it equals success it's easier to take a dog that's naturally like that than take one that's not and then make it like that well yes and no um most of the time Again, this is just what I've seen over the years. If a dog is naturally independent, uh, most of the time, the, the dog has a little jealous streak in him. You mm -hmm. know, 20 years ago, that was, you know, uh, I seen it, you know, before we went to where it is now. Uh, if that dog was, when they said, talk about independence, that dog was sulked up because a coon got treated on him. Yeah. So, so he was jealous. That's what made him naturally independent. I don't want to have a jealous tree dog. I don't want because... Here's what I'm going to share with you. You go into some areas in the hunts that we hunt in today, and you know a guide you're unfamiliar with the territory. You may want to score on one or two coon, right? And and when you cut loose, and that first particular track is struck right there, mm -hmm. they burn it through there and get treed, and you don't get a piece of it because you're naturally jealous because you didn't get there first or whatever right. it may be. So you're sulking off over through here. And now this dog goes out and you tree a coon, the one that was jealous, treat a coon and you tree another coon, guess who just got beat? Right. And I see it a lot. I see it in the hunts today. You you can see it. And I've never, you know, uh, I've never had one that I've, you know, I mean, don't get me wrong. I've, you know, like everyone else, you got to have one that's what needs to be by itself uh, the bulk of the time. Every, every good dog that I ever had uh, that I competed with, I've had to do work in that department. Yeah, uh, I and agree. that's just and I've and I've been very fortunate. I, I've had some good ones, even but when, I've had to do work in that department. You even know? when you get the ones that are naturally, you know, sort of independent, they like to. They're I call them. I'm looking for leaders. Yeah, when I'm looking in hounds, I'm looking for leaders. I'm not looking for the dog that's standing around waiting to find out what everything else is going to do before it decides how it's going to hunt that night. Um, when I unsnap them, I want them to have one thing on their mind, and that's going and finding a raccoon, regardless of what's going on around them. You know, out of the truck, a lot of times, I don't get balled up about dogs treeing together out of the truck. You, I want a piece of that. Even if it's a second, if I've got right. a first strike and a second tree, boom, boom, that's 175 compared to maybe he's got a third strike and 100. I'm still leading the cast at that point. Right. So to go out there and say, oh, my dog will never treat with another dog. Personally, I don't want that. Coming out of the truck, it's everybody's game. Now, after that first tree and we, we cut them loose, I want my, my dogs going and finding some new territory 
and hunting their own coon. But out of the truck, it's it's anybody's game. They're running down a lane. They come across a hot track. Boom, they put it up. I want my dog to have a piece of that. Right. Well, I think, I think too, you know, uh, for the last several years uh, on that side of it, um, you know, blowing in there a half a mile, I guess you'd say, Trina, real quick one, you know, uh, it worked. But I do believe that the, it is starting to change now. I think if you can get one that, that you know, of course, now they got to have a nose to do this, but I think if you can get one that trees them raccoons around you, uh, you know, I mean, face it, here's where we're, I mean, we have to be honest with ourselves. 30 years ago, you had more territory. You could, a dog could get in there a three quarters of a mile and not get himself in trouble, you mm-hmm. know, or a mile, whatever. And, you know, times change. And now what's happening is, is these ones that are blowing in there a mile to get treed, most of the time are, are going to be somewhere they can't be on or whatever. And, uh, you know, them days, what's going to happen is, I, you know, just watching what's unfolded the last couple of years, there's going to be a lot of times when you get over there to score that dog, you can't mm-hmm. because he's on territory you can't be on or whatever it may be. And if you have one that goes hunting out of the truck and uh, and, and trees one, a quarter, you know, six, five, 600 yards in there, works a track in there and gets treed on it, uh, most of the time he's probably going to have that one scored uh, and either be cut back loose or whatever it may be, uh, hunting the territory that it's in. And, uh, you know, I think that um, I think that's something that we all have to, to look at as, as time goes on uh, because we just don't have, we don't have the parcels to be able to uh, have that style where you can be a mile one way and a mile the other way. The, the other thing that brings, brings this to a point is like if we're hunting in northern Indiana, some people could say, you know, if I'm sitting on a first strike, my dog doesn't have to stop at that first tree and take a second tree. I want him to blow past there and get in there because there's so many coons. He's going to he's gonna get one tree, and now I'm sitting at 200, a first and a first. But if I'm hunting the Appalachians, North Carolina or something like that, and it's a gamble whether I'm going to get another coon that night. So I think maybe it changes with with where you're hunting and where you're hunting most of the time and the style of dog that you really need. Right. Well, absolutely. I, but you know, at the end of the day, uh, them good ones have a knack of them good ones have a knack of, of, of finding them raccoons and training them. Yeah, uh, that's just, I mean, you know, I as most people know for me on the on the striking thing, I you know I, I've said this in uh, and I, I see it on both sides. But for me, if you're competing for the kind of money that we're competing for today. Uh, you don't see the you know the NFL or the NBA or the NASCAR or whatever. They don't get a minute. Uh, you know when they start to the race, they don't have a minute to mess up. And then and okay, now we're going to go official. And uh, you know, in in for me, um, you know, and, and again, this is just a matter of opinion. Uh, you know, we you know we're we're giving these dogs, uh, and I don't even know why I bring this up for because it, it's irrelevant. When you got a dog that consistently is a raccoon treer. Most of the time, uh, they're going to come out to winter. I mean, mm-hmm. in some situ- situations, they're not. Yeah. You know, but, uh, you know, I think that uh, I think that'll be a debate for, for years to come on that side of it. Obviously, as you know, Chris, we go back far enough. I remember when we didn't have that. You know, we didn't have no grace period. And if you had one that loose sparked a little bit when it left you, uh, you know, you worked on that before you went to a hunt because right. you knew it was just a matter of time. You yeah. sitting in the truck. But well, you know, the, the 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 automatic strike dog came about with a one hour cast. Well, you know, let's face it; these, these dogs. I mean, I have one. I've one cast on strike points. Yeah, you know, I want that hundred, especially in a one hour cast, because if you got four dogs splitting up in a one hour cast, more than likely, if all four of them tree raccoons, by the time you score that last dog, your time's up. Yeah. Well, yeah, in, in, in a lot of scenarios on that. But, you know, we this is a timed event. These dogs today, uh, with the technology that we have, I mean, these, these dogs are, they're stallions. I mean, they're, I mean, they're, they're incredible. They're really a, a freak of, of nature, I guess you could say. I mean, some of them. I mean, you take just the, the recent, you was talking about the Derby earlier. Mm-hmm. You know, uh, when you're training for a particular event, when you're training for that hour hunt or you're training for that two-hour hunt or whatever, you know, we often hear the debate, I wish they'd go back to three-hour hunts. Well, uh, yes and no. Some of you may want to go back to that three-hour hunt, 
But some of them, I guarantee you're not going to want to because if you was getting beat by 700 in the first two hours, you're probably going to be getting beat by 1,000 in the third <laughs> hour because, you know, we hunt early and late. You know, they're, even today, most of these big hunts are being won by hunting two hours early and two hours late. And if you look at the, a lot of, you know, we hear this often, you know, well, if I had the, the funds to go to these hunts, you know, I could compete on that level. Well, I got... I got news for you. There's enough people out there today. If you got a good one, he's going to get in the right owner's hands and you're going to be able to take him there. The problem is, is when you get there, it debunks your theory that what you have is good enough real quick because most of these dogs, not all of them, but most of these dogs competing in these big hunts that where there's quite a bit at stake, you may draw one that maybe is just having an off night or mediocre or whatever, but the other two, you got one choice to win that cast and tree more tree more raccoons than what they do, and uh, you're not going to get a you're not going to get a you're just not going to get a freebie on that side of it. And, and I've hunted with a lot of them, and there's I can tell you there's a lot of really really exceptional hounds right now. And I th I think a lot of it is is uh, do I think the dogs are better than what they was 30 years ago? We could debate that for you're going to get everybody's going to have a different opinion on that. What I do think is the biggest difference go it goes back to the technology that we have. You know, I remember years ago before a tracking collar, uh, you'd cut a dog loose and wouldn't hear nothing of him for 20 minutes, and all of a sudden that dog would open up 200 yards from you, and you'd think to yourself, man, that sucker's got to be the slowest thing That's that right. there is or whatever. Yeah. And, hey, now you have a Garmin, and I've watched it. I mean, a dog that has a lot of hunt to him, uh, especially one that doesn't want to hunt out of hearing, they may be all the way to the end of that section and be zigzagging coming back across and 12 minutes later may open 300 yards to your right hand, but they've covered a half a mile or hunting more. for one or more yeah. for hunting for one. And, you know, years ago we got rid of them because he didn't have any hunt. So you can see that, <laughs> you can see that side of it. And I think that's where, you know, uh, the technology has really helped, you know, the, the dogs that I do believe that, um, you know, the dogs of today from, you know, I started obviously hunting with, with hounds 40 years ago. Right. And, uh, uh, I do think that uh, uh, the ones that we have today, uh, they're, it, it's amazing some of the athletes these dogs are. It really is. There's no doubt about it. And the other thing about going to these hunts, um, if you're getting into especially the late rounds, you're not. it's hard enough to find a dog in the early rounds that's a counterfeit. You know, but you start getting deep in it, those dogs are coon triers. They are, and I'll tell you, um, as you're seeing more and more, uh, these big hunts, when you're competing for that kind of money, uh, these big hunts are going to areas to where that dog, you know, again, 20 years ago, we go to areas where you tree one coon, you'd win the cast, raccoon, you'd win the cast. Now, uh, I, I can tell you people, I mean, it'd be pretty hard pressed for somebody to put up a $6,500 entry fee in going there knowing that you're going to be in a cast where you're probably going to score on one raccoon early and one raccoon late. Uh, they're going to wait till the following weekend to where they know that they're going to an area where commonly you're going to score on multiple raccoons early and multiple raccoons sure. late. Why wouldn't you? Yeah. You know, and, uh, you know, again, I think it goes back to, uh, I think it goes back to the, you know, it goes back to the side of uh, we can see and watch uh, what these dogs are doing. But, but I tell you, Chris, man, there's, there's, an, there's just a lot of really good dogs out there. It's not – hey, for anybody that uh, – uh, and this is the truth series. Uh, the, here's the truth of the matter. If you think you have one that's good enough, then I'm going to encourage you to reach out. There's people looking right now. Every day you see it on the social media and in uh, – you know, word of mouth or whatever. There's many people right now looking for that one that can compete on the big stage because you can make money. You know, the good ones break even, the great ones make money. Mm -hmm. uh, and then there's about 70% of them that scratch their head after a year and wonder why they even competed. Right. You know, and so <clears throat> if you have a good enough one, you can find a guy that'll say, hey, let's go try this $2,500 hunt out. And, uh, you know, here's the truth of it. Uh, most of the time they hunt one or two of them and uh, they realize that there needs to be a whole lot more work done in order for them to compete against what's what the good ones that are out there. Right. Yeah. 
I'm sure you're going to talk about handlers and stuff at some point while you're hosting this show, but real quick, you know, those guys, a lot of times what I see is those guys that think they've got a great dog. They look good at the house and then they get them out there on the stage and they figure out that their dog's not as good as they thought it was. Uh, the other thing is they find out is they don't know the rules. And so when they get beat, then the Monday morning on Facebook is they got cheated at the hunt by right. somebody. And it's just not common that it happens. I mean, it's very rare that someone out and out cheats. And, and the other three people in that cast are going to call you on it if you're trying it. And because they're out there to compete too. It's hard. It's hard to, to, to really cheat. There's a difference between, and again, I'll go back to the Derby. You know, there's certain things that that rider, that jockey knows that he can do with that, that horse where he can, where he can maneuver his horse and put it on the track to give him an advantage without violating a rule, you know, where he's not banging somebody into the rail NASCAR, you know, there are certain places that, you know, you could, you push it right to the envelope without violating the rules. And he's not cheating. If he's playing within the rules, he's put putting himself in an advantageous position according to the rules. And if you go to a big hunt and you don't know how to do that, you're probably going to get beat. And that doesn't mean you were cheated. Right. And I can tell you, uh, most of them, uh, when you go to them events like that, um, you know, I still see it pop up, you know, that, you know, these hunts are nothing, you know, uh, well, let's just face it, you know, that, you know, well, everybody cheats. Well, I got news for you. Um, if you consistently think that, then you need to take a good look in the mirror. Um, I've been on a few casts that I wish to forget, but I've been on, I have been on a way more good casts than ever an occasional. Occasionally, you're going to draw a cast where people are just miserable to hunt with. And, uh, you can, and, and, them guys come and go because you can only do that for so long and then you're going to fade out because you, you, I'm not saying you wear out your welcome. Um, your, your theory changes. Okay. And you're just, you know, the, uh, the, the, the bad ones weed out themselves. Um, Let me give you an example. So this, this happened to me and went young and young in the game and I go to a hunt and we end up treeing and we're treed we're split treed. Okay. The trees are probably 30 yards apart. Instead of when we realized that we had a, a split tree deal there, that was my opportunity to say, stop. How are we, we see what this is. Let's look, let's look at the canopy. Is this going to be scored as one tree or two trees? You do that before you ever start your shine time. I didn't do that. It's like, okay, I'm going to go handle my dog. You handle your dog. My dog's got a rat, got a coon in her tree. These dogs over here don't have a coon. So guess what? The, the two guys, the other two guys, guess how they vote? They're going to say, oh, we're going to score this as one tree. They didn't even touch. I mean, there were twigs. But I allowed that to happen by not saying, okay, we can see the situation here. Let's decide right now. Are we scoring this as one or two? If, we did, if I would have done that as a handler, stopped them right then and decided how I was going to do that, then that could have never happened. They weren't <laughs> cheating me. They weren't cheating me. There is a slight possibility there, but that's something that I let somebody else take advantage of the situation. Right. I got to tell you a funny story on that. Um, it's not, I mean, it wasn't funny at the time, but you just look back at it. So we was at the Nationals this year, and, uh, and I, was, I was hunting Babe, and uh, it was the second night, so it had been Thursday night hunting, uh, we have a fairly close cast. I moved, mean, scored on a couple of raccoons or whatever, and I'm leading. I'm leading the cast. And um, we, uh, I get treed, and uh, I tree her, and she's treed probably a minute or two. Another dog comes in and covers her. Now, he's really the only other dog that can beat me. Well, when we walk in, there was kind of a crazy situation. There was a, she was, uh, Babe was treed on a log going up into a bunch of vines that are kind of going up, appears to go into this big tree. And she, like I said, she had worked this track through a, a, like a rough cut. Uh, they had logged it a few years before that, so it was kind of rough getting into them. And this other dog had come in and treed with her, and he's treed, 
on a tree that's literally like, I mean, it's like probably two inches in between this particular log that kind of goes up tree and Babe's tree and these vines and he's treated on this tree that's right by that log mm -hmm. like two inches away yeah and so a se same scenario we how are we going to score this and i said well it needs to be scored as two separate trees now i'm knowing in my mind that there's no way you know i mean that she's if she's going to be treated up in these vines i'm fully expecting these vines going this big tree we're going to find this coon there he may have a coon he may not i don't know i know he come in he never trailed a tr uh, track in her he just come in and fell treat with her yeah and so he obviously wanted it scored as one. And I said, no, we're scoring it as two trees, you know, et cetera, whatever. So they agree we're going to score it as two trees. <laughs> well, the vines go up, don't go into that big tree, and the coon's sitting in the tree this dog's in. <laughs> <laughs> so you know me, or, you know, I, just, I looked at it, I kind of chuckled to myself. Now, I didn't have any benefit. I, it should have probably, it should have probably, hindsight's twenty twenty. You're looking at the situation, should have probably been scored as one. But I lobbied so hard to have it scored as two. I just put it on the leash and I said, "Hey, there's like seven minutes that's going on." I said, "Good, good luck, good luck in the late round." You know what I mean? Uh, it, it's it's one of them things. But back to you, it is good if you discuss that beforehand. Uh, in, well, I'm just using that example yeah. as an overall deal. Where as a handler, I have a responsibility to make sure that that, and I I know exactly what you're saying because if you say, "Okay, we're going to score it as two separate," that particular night. I could have been slick and they could have had the coon and they would have said, okay, we're scoring it separate, you know? Yeah. Well, you know, what I've noticed too uh, in the hunts, you know, these hunts that you're spending $2,500 or above to enter in, 95% uh, of them guys that are coming there, uh, they know the rules. They know the deal. Most of these dogs are by themselves. Um, mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, pro sport, I love pro sports rules. Um, uh, the fact is the cast stays together, uh, is, is huge because, you know, it seems to me like in the hunts and stuff, most of the time when there is a question or a problem, it usually has to do with, uh, someone being sent to go handle a dog off on his own. Um, you know, using their yeah, thermal on the know, way to the tree. Well, <laughs> I mean, most of the time, most of the questions, what I've noticed that come in, uh, has usually to do with when when a cast is separated. Uh, I've seen it happen time and time again. And I think when you're all four, when all four handlers are walking in there together, um, you know, it just it just seems like there's a lot less. You I mean, I, hey, kudos to this past weekend on on Greg and them guys putting the the pro sport hunt on. I don't think they had one question come in with that kind of an entry fee at stake. And, and, you know, I mean, we know, I mean, the first place winner is a hundred thousand dollars and not to have a single question, uh, come back. Kudos to the hunters. Yeah. Kudos to the guys out there competing. Right. Because, you know, and I've hunted them hunts and there's a lot of times where I've walked even into my tree and, uh, before I can even get her leashed up, judge says, start shine time. Here he is. And it's hollered out by one of the other handlers. Right. So it, de it demissed that, uh, you know, that theory of, you know, these guys are out there, uh, win at all costs. Is it going to happen occasionally? Yes. But most of the time, them guys were out there welcome very quickly, mm -hmm. you know. And, uh, you know, uh, it's just, I love the fact of, of where we're at. The opportunities that are out there right now, it's incredible. And I love, I mean, I love it because, you know, uh, you take like, some, you know, what's awesome about it is, you know, you take like the TOC. I know we did coverage on that. Yeah. But what's awesome about the TOC, uh, anyone, anyone can compete at that hunt. What, a 13-year-old kind of, kid? Yeah. And, you know, there was a 19-year-old, uh, 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 one that made the top six, mm -hmm. um, that, you know, I, I don't quote me on it, but I think it was the first time that he had competed outside of his home state. Yeah. You know, and uh, gets in the top six, you know, and almost won doing the coverage on it. Almost won uh, the cat heads up cast competing against one of the hottest dogs, Joe Manning and and uh, Dominator, one of the hottest dogs going right now. Yeah. So that's the awesome part of this. If you've got a dog good enough, that there's enough of them hunt. Even there's even enough of them opportunities around to where you can go hunt a two hundred dollar pro classic or a three hundred dollar pro classic or like a TOC. And uh, but you know at a hunt of that magnitude, like a TOC. You got to have a little. You got to have a good dog 
but you got to have a little luck along the way. You bet. You bet. You know? And what did Joe Manning do when he got beat? Uh, shook his hand. Absolutely. You know, and, and I think he gave him a pat. You know, it wasn't just a handshake, like "Hey, good game" type thing. It was like, man, he reaches out there and he grabs that kid's hand. He shakes his hand, and gives him a slap on the shoulder, and yeah. congratulation. And for anybody that's a naysayer that thinks that that does not exist, man, these people are prof- we're professionals. Yeah. And if you can't conduct yourself like a professional, then go find something else to do. Well, and I think that I and, and Chris, I think that a lot of them ones uh, are going and finding something else to do because I, I really believe now in, in you know, competing in these hunts again, you know, not to beat a dead horse. Uh, it goes back to is if you conduct yourself like a gentleman out there, uh, you're going to get treated like a gentleman. I really believe mm-hmm. that. And uh, if you, you know, walk in, a, I don't care where you walk in. If you walk in with a chip on your shoulder. Somebody is more than happy to try to knock it off. <laughs> you know, you will find that person that, I mean, if they will, they will find you. Yeah. So it doesn't matter. It's just a rule for life. You yeah. know, if, if you want to fight, somebody can find You can find somebody. It's easy. Yeah. That's the easy part. Yeah. And, you know, um, you know, one thing too, uh, going back to a point you had made earlier, on the winning the early rounds, the late rounds, you know, these dogs are competing for four hours a night, uh, that kind of thing. I've owned some, I've been very fortunate over the years and owned some really good ones. And for several years, I couldn't, I couldn't win a late, it just seemed, I could get to the late round, but I couldn't win a late round. Yeah. And I just thought, you know, you know, I just get, you know, I, in my mind until I obviously reached out and watched what these other guys was doing. Uh, the reason a lot of them dogs don't, can't compete on the late round is because they're not trained to be able to compete in the late round. And uh, a lot of us, for me, I had a job. I had a construction business, you know, and, and I could go out and hunt a couple hours and then I needed to get to bed because, you know, five o'clock was coming. You had to put groceries and on the table. I had to put groceries on the table. And, you know, I'll give you an example. When country come along, um, I was in a situation in my life where, I could hunt early. Uh, you know, Kim, my wife Kim, she'll even tell you, I would come back in, you know, for a couple hours, maybe hunt something else, and uh, at 3.30 in the morning, uh, get a hold of a couple of my friends, and we'd hunt till daylight. And, uh, you know, it was at that point in time that, you know, a lot of these guys that have early round cast winners and then can't compete in the late round, it's, a lot of times it's not that their dog's not good enough, it's just they're not conditioned for it. They're not trained for it. And right. so, you know, when these guys think that they have something that's good enough to hunt, they may, you know, it's one thing on winning an early round. It's another thing going back, letting that dog lay up in that dog box for two hours, two and a half hours, and then go back out and compete in that late round and be sharp. Because, again, the competition is so strong <clears throat> that, that, especially in big hunts, you know, one mistake by you or one mistake by a dog it's almost impossible to come back from right well good it's a good thing we've got heath producing his shows on wednesday because he's gonna he's gonna take us on that journey and that's what it's called the journey he's going to talk to us about how to get the most out of those dogs through training and things like that and um, i think it's going to be awesome that people will have multiple episodes a week to to get the things they need to be successful absolutely so um we were planning on talking about a bunch of old dogs how long we've been going for you know i don't know um during the timer on that thing yeah 52 minutes oh my goodness so what's your earliest what's your earliest memory of coon hunting well uh so i was i grew up in wisconsin or i was born in indiana and we moved to wisconsin when i was five years old I believe I was five years old, and uh, obviously, as most people know, for those that don't know me, I was actually born and raised in an Amish community, and uh, went to a uh, went to a one room uh, schoolhouse that was about five miles from our house. Did you drive a buggy or did you walk? Well, in the in the no, we we would take uh, so it was cold up there in the winter, but in the fall time of the year, mm-hmm. we would ride our bikes, um, yeah, uh, some, and uh, but we also rode horseback. We yeah. had a, there was a, a horse barn that was put up at the school. And uh, we would ride our ponies to, to school a lot of times in the mornings or coming home at night. As we got older, obviously, we riding horses. Uh, we broke some horses, you know, at home and, and that kind of thing. But um, 
we'd ride our bikes, or ride a horse, and then when it got cold out, we had uh, top buggies. We would take that. But uh, uh, I remember uh, vividly um, when uh, first and second grade, so it would have been in the third grade, however old I would have been then, First and second grade, we went to a... Well, for a, a, for you, it, you might have been 13 in the third grade. No, I, I, I actually, <laughs> hey, uh, to, to clarify that, I actually gra- graduated from eighth grade at 14 years old. So, <laughs> yeah, I got a diploma to prove it. But no, anyways, uh, it would have been in the third grade. Yeah. Uh, we had actually switched school. We had put a new schoolhouse up, and, uh, and they divided the church, you know, east to west, and we went to the west side, and so we went to a new church. And I remember riding my bike uh, to school, and went past his place. A uh, guy's name is Dave Nelson. And uh, he had these dogs. Didn't even know what a hound was up to that point. But he had these dogs. And when we would ride our bikes past, they would bark. Mm-hmm. And I thought that was the, I mean, I just, I would stop my bike and I would just look over through there. And, it, and there was, he had blue ticks and walkers, had one red, I think, well, his brother may have had a red bone. But they had them deep ball mouths, oh, yeah. you know. And uh, it just, I don't know, it did something, you know, it was just something that I was fascinated with. And uh, it was later that year, uh, it would have been later that year sometime, I was riding my bike, coming home, and uh, he actually hauled cattle. And he had a a truck with a cattle trailer behind it, and he was in his driveway. And you have to understand, back then, my primary language that I spoke was German. Mm -hmm. You know, I I mean, I was getting taught English in school. And... uh, so, Deutsch. Yeah, that's right. You can dash that stuff. But anyways, uh, we, uh, I, I wheeled in there with my bike, and my brother was really upset at me because he's my older brother, so he had take, you know, they had him and my oldest sister, which was, you know, uh, they would have been probably the fourth grade and the fifth grade or whatever. They kind of took care of the younger ones, and I just, I kind of held back, and I just whipped it in his driveway and went up there and, and uh, started speaking to him in German, which you couldn't stand a, I couldn't understand a lick of it. I'm asking him about them dogs. And, uh, and so he kind of got logistic. And he said, well, they're coon hounds or whatever. And I'm just like fascinated. And he, I walk around there and I look at them. And, and, uh, and then, you know, of course, they was big and bu- uh, big mouths. Anyways, he, uh, he said, well, who's your dad? And I said, told him in German, well, it's my dad. And, uh, no, what's your dad's name? I said, it's dad. And uh, he kind of <laughs> chuckled and he said, I think I know where you belong. He said, I'll be down to see your dad in a few days. And, uh, of course, you know, now... My brothers and, and you know, sister, had, they, they're on down the road, so I hop on the bike, and I take off for home. And uh, sure enough, about a week later, uh, it was on a weekend, on a Saturday, I believe it was, uh, he wheels in there with that truck and trailer, and he gets to talking to Dad, and he tells Dad that I'd stop by there. And, of course, Dad's you know, he's not <laughs> real happy about it at the time. because. Uh, but then, anyways, he told him, he said, hey, if you, ever, uh, if you don't mind when season comes in, uh, they didn't summer hunt much. Right. You know, it was all season. And uh, he said, I wouldn't mind coming up, you know, and, and picking your boys up and going. Now, my dad never coon hunted, but he was an avid hunter. He deer hunted, went out to Montana for eight straight years when we was young and hunted mule deer and that kind of thing. So he was an avid hunter. So we kind of got that side of it natural, but none of my other family had hunted. And uh, I remember vividly him coming down, picking us boys up. And uh, I remember it like it was yesterday. They had a, they had a, he had a walker dog. I can't remember what his name was, Tom maybe or something. They had a, a blue dog they named Blue. Everything um, was named Tom back then after well, house is Tom Tom. Exactly. And, yeah. Well, it had a little blue tick female called Ann, and then it had a red bone called Jim. And uh, here's a story on the Jim dog. He had one of the best locates on a hound that I've ever heard. You know, of course, it was the first time I'd heard that. But to this day, I don't know if I've ever heard a dog that had a, a locate like him uh, he had a just a big dying ball locate, and he would drag it way out to his voice would quiver. Didn't have a lot of volume, but he yeah. would do this, you know, probably three or four minutes before he got warmed up, and then bring it to a short ball. And that's where I fell in love with that a, a dogs with a with that kind of a locate. And uh, you know, I, you know, I've I've hunted some pretty good dogs over the years uh, that didn't have much of a locate and didn't keep them just for that reason. You know, in my younger, you know, that's just where I was at. Yeah. But anyways, we went hunting, and uh, my two brothers went with me. One, one brother did not care about I don't know if he ever went after that. And uh, I can tell you, uh, I was hooked from that night. I, I couldn't get enough of it. I mean, we, I started hunting with them quite a bit, and uh, uh, it got to the point where it actually, <laughs> funny story, we actually, uh, um, 
I, I, there, there was a time or two where I actually hung the fire ladder out the window, uh, snuck out, would run down the road to go hunting with him. Um, and of course, obviously, until Dad figured it out or whatever. And, and uh, you know, but I was just, that's kind of where my, you know, it was, it was that, that's where it was sparked at. And then I just started from there and hunted ever since. You know, when I was a kid, we slept on a second story bedroom and we had a pole outside of our window and it was put there for a window air conditioning unit. Of course, we didn't have it. The people that owned the house, the house was built in the early 1900s. Um, so they had it modernized so they could put a window air conditioner in there, blah, blah, blah. Well, it was a great way I could climb up and down that pole. And I did the same thing. <laughs> I would awesome. slip out that window and, and grab a hold of that pole and shimmy down the side of the house, go out and grab my dog and go to the creek. And I could hear, they, we slept with windows open. So I thought I was being real sneaky until the night that dad comes out on the porch and starts shooting a gun up in the air and saying, <laughs> get your blankety blank back here. Oh, I know yeah. you're out there hunting. And yeah. uh, I, I cont- it did, still didn't deter me until one night, dad, dad was not a coon hunter. And so, but he learned the patterns of the nights that I wanted to go. So he learned the good nights to be hunting. And I'm about halfway down one night and dad's standing at the bottom waiting on me to come out. <laughs> oh yeah. I know that. I know that feeling. I, uh, uh, so mom and dad never locked the doors at home. I, I don't ever remember. We didn't uh, either. I don't ever remember mom and dad when we left. I mean, we, would, we didn't leave to go on, uh, you know, unless there was a wedding or a, a funeral. It's about the one time we would go on a trip or whatever, but. I don't ever remember mom and dad uh, locking the doors when I grew up as a kid ever. I I remember I remember when we were kids, we went on this big vacation, and the biggest one we ever took uh, out west, and we were going to be gone like two and a half weeks. I remember dad installing locks on the house that had keys because we didn't know where the keys for, to the doors were. Right, oh, we yeah. didn't know. Yeah, you know, uh, but but that but after a while. Uh, that fire ladder that was hanging out the window was kind of on a chain. You know how them ones yeah. were going to chain? Yeah. And the wind would blow, and it would knock against the side. And Mom got upset at Dad one night, and she goes, you got to figure out what this banging is. And, of course, Dad got upset, and, and he tried to figure it out a few times, couldn't figure it out. And he walked out there, and he seen that this here was this fire ladder. So Christian Nacho, you know what he does, goes upstairs, pulls a fire ladder up, folds it up, puts it in the box, <laughs> closes the window, and locks the doors. So uh, that was one night the doors was locked when that all come to a head. But, you know, I have to, I have to say this. Uh, I was probably 13 or 14 at the time. I, was, I think it was in the last grade of, of school, so it would have been right around that time frame. Uh, I, will have to give, I will have to say this about Dad. He, he understood the passion of hunting. Right. And uh, I could never go on a Saturday night or a Sunday night uh, cause you know, we had church on Sundays and that kind of thing, but he would let me hunt pretty much any night, Monday through Friday that I wanted to, uh, as long as I did my chores, got up with the rest of the kids, did my chores. And, uh, as long as I kept good grades in school. And I, I yeah. believe I, I was actually just, just past, uh, thanks or this past Thanksgiving or Christmas, I actually pulled out my old report card and, uh, mom had saved all them. We was actually went through it. Mom was in for, for Christmas. I believe it was. I think my parents burned and, mine. I'm glad my hunting was not dependent exactly. on grades. I can because, tell you that. Because, but it was kind of funny because we went through it and I, I don't know, I ended up with like an A minus average or a B plus or whatever in my eighth grade year or whatever. Oh, and I said, that was, bragging. I said, that was, that was because of the hunting thing. But you know, he let me go hunting. Yeah. Uh, and of course, you know, the more I went, you know, of course we just hunted kill season up then, you know, in, in Wisconsin, I think it come in. October the 15th or something like that. And, uh, you know, them, you know, that was a long time ago. So them guys made, you know, that a lot of them had Christmas off of, you know, that coon hunting thing. Now for me, I obviously was just learning, was riding along, didn't have my own dog. But I think I got, it was at that time, probably at 12, 13, I got my first dog. I'll never forget it. Worked that summer to try to save money up. I don't know, 20 or $25 and, uh, bought this coon hound that was half, half hawk or half beagle. Uh, I bought it to coon hunt with, but it didn't. Uh, it never treated coon. It never treated raccoon. <laughs> my first coon dog didn't either. I graduated in the half of my class that made the top half look good. Right. Yeah. <laughs> oh yeah. Absolutely. Uh, somebody's got. Somebody's got to make that top half look good. The re- I think the reason my parents continued to approve of me hunting 
is because they knew when I, w- I was so passionate about it. I, I didn't have a lot. I'm not saying that I was a saint or an angel because I did my share of running around and doing stuff I shouldn't have been doing. But for the most part, my parents knew that if I was hunting, that I wasn't out there getting in trouble, you know? Right. Well, for us, for us, that was a little bit different case scenario because we didn't have a whole lot to get in trouble with because we lived in Don't a very... T- I live in an Amish well, community. I know what well, a little heathens lived, you guys hey, are. Yeah, we lived, we lived in a very rural... Now, don't get me wrong. Uh, there was five of us boys in a row, and uh, we was very... Uh, we wasn't bad, but right. we was very mischievous. If there exactly. was something that could be put together, uh, orchestrated, made up, whatever, you know, uh, we was in it, you know, from uh, making, trying to make homemade parachutes and, and, oh, and yeah. that whole thing. You know, a lot of fun. You know, I, I always share with people, we grew up fairly poor, um, but we had more than most. Mm-hmm. Uh, we really did. We we didn't know. You lived we, simple. We lived, we lived simple, but, simple. you know, we always had food on the table. And, uh, you know, I, I, was, I shared this the other day uh, to a friend of mine. I remember, uh, that, you know, for some years, we wouldn't get a birthday present and a Christmas present all in the same year. I mean, one year we may get a Christmas present. The following year we may get a birthday present. And I remember uh, getting a quarter one year, and I went to town with Dad. And uh, that was back when Juicy Fruit and Big Red, you could buy uh, a pack of that gum for a nickel. Yeah. And, and so I, I got to buy a pack of that gum. And I still had 20 cents left over, and I thought I was a millionaire because, you know, I'm doing the math in my head. That cost a nickel. I mean, I still got five, four times more than that left. I can get you know? a pack of Big Red next week. <laughs> exactly. So, and you know. You probably, you probably ABC chewed it, too. You probably chewed it for a little bit, wrapped it back up to make it last. Well, we, 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 won't go down, we won't go down that trail. But, <laughs> but you know, we had, you know we, had, we had everything we needed growing up, you know. Um, you know, we, it was just. It, to do, if it had to do it all over with, I wouldn't want to have been raised any different than what right. I was raised. I, I was raised in a, uh, you know, the, you know, the values we was taught to work. You know, um, you know, we played hard, uh, but it was all homemade games. You know, from, you know, things that you know, kick the can to king base to room jail to whatever it may be. Right. And uh, but it was. I, I tell you, my youth, my youth in my twenties, um, wouldn't trade a thing. Right. Absolutely wouldn't trade a thing. You know, people, people, today it's a lot easier to draw um, these lines or these boundaries between the way the Amish community lives and the way the English community lives, the way the rest of us do. But I think anybody that's over 50 that grew up in rural America will say that the way that we grew up and the way you grew up were not that different. No, they really weren't. We had electric Mm -hmm. and we had flushing toilets. You know, that was basically the difference. But we didn't have air conditioning. We didn't have we didn't. Mom didn't run us everywhere we wanted to go every day. Um, So we had I had six kids in my family. I don't know how many you had, but we were together and we had jobs to do every day. And we played hard after that. But we were you know, swinging ropes across the loft of the barn and playing army and, and just anything we could find. Oh, And when we got old enough, then we started hunting. My brother had rabbit dogs and I had coon dogs and, and we spent a lot of time hunting. We loved it. We, yeah, we, we had rabbit, we had beagles. Uh, we rabbit hunted. Oh my goodness. And of course our transportation to get around, uh, we had one of three ways. Now we, in the early years, we didn't have uh, tractors. Uh, so it was horses. We farmed with horses, but when we moved to Wisconsin, uh, we lived in a, what they call a New Order Amish church. And, and that's another thing, you know, on, on that side of it. There's many different communities um, to where maybe the material uh, things are a little different. Mm-hmm. You know, for us, we had uh, <clears throat> tractors up to 85 horse. Um, we had uh, we actually had electricity. Uh, we had indoor plumbing. Uh, I remember graduating from having to bath in a tub uh, to, you know, actually, you know, to that side of it or whatever. Um but we drove the horse and buggy, and uh, but when we would hunt, we could either there was a lot of times we just walked out back, and uh, it was probably a good quarter of a mile back to our woods. We had a forty acre woods, and we'd start hunting from there. And uh, there's some nights we come home with our dogs, and some nights we didn't. Know. You know what yeah. I mean? Yeah. And uh, in course we didn't have a we didn't really have a good phone line to get a hold of, 
But you know, everybody knew everybody around there. So if if he if that dog turned up somewhere and you had Burt Kohler on the, you know, I don't I don't I don't even think we would have had name tags back then. They just somehow showed back up at your house. And uh, not only that, but but people in your community, like all of our neighbors, our closest neighbor was probably almost a mile away yeah. in ag country, you know, and you could see their houses. But the white sides knew I had coon dogs. Oh yeah. So if my coon dog showed up at their place, they knew where it went. Yep. If it showed up at my aunt Melva's down the road, she knew where it went. <laughs> oh yeah. And we would get the phone call, and I'd rode my bike down there to get oh, the yeah. dog, and all my dogs I could run them right beside the bike. You talk about crazy. You know, riding a freaking bicycle with a dog on a leash, and they had to learn how to do it. I can't begin to tell you how many wipeouts I've had out on with a bike, with having a couple dogs tied to the back. <laughs> I can tell you, but you know what? They learn pretty quick that once they wiped you out once or twice, they learn pretty quick that you know the best thing for them to do is, is trot along. You know, and of course, then we had to, when we got tractors. When I got a little older, uh, we would take these tractors. Uh, funny story, we'd take these tractors. And uh, somewhere in Guthrie, Kentucky, they had a gear that they would put in these uh, little Ford ends and uh, the Ford 3600s and stuff where you could actually have like an overdrive gear that would hook in with the PTO. And uh, you could get these things humming at about 40 mile an hour. And uh, we built... Well, that's safe. <laughs> not safe at all, but we did it. But we would make Tires these Tires not balanced, sitting there, you're wobbling, you get the you would, death wobble yeah, going. Exactly. So we, had, we built these boxes that you'd put on a three-point hitch of a tractor. And, uh, man, hey, we won a jackpot there. You, you know what bet. I mean? You could get around a section uh, a whole lot quicker than, you know, and hunted out of a, hey, hunted out of a horse and buggy a time or two. So, yeah. you know, I, I look back at them memories and, and uh, I wouldn't trade it for nothing. I really wouldn't. It, it's, it's probably where the love of following a hound come from. Absolutely. Because uh, you had to work, you had to work so hard, you know, and as you know, I mean, I, you may get lucky and get a good one right out of the gate. Hey, if we had one that, uh, treed a possum, uh, we was tickled pink cause it treed, you know, <laughs> no and, and, uh, you know, tree and a coon was, a you know, that was kind of a, a rarity early on, but you know, I have to say that like Dave Nelson and his brother, Ron, his brother, Ricky, uh, them guys was, they bear hunted, they coon hunted. They, I remember fox hunting with them guys. Uh, you know, uh, they obviously, uh, they would just, they, they hunted everything that pretty much walked. Mm-hmm. And, uh, you know, them guys, and then there was another guy, uh, up there, his name was, uh, Wally Boyer and, uh, he hunted red bones and, uh, he kind of, uh, he, he was a, he was kind of a mentor. He did a, he, he'd go down to the white, what they call white water or white something in, in Southern Wisconsin. And, uh, he would hunt every year and come back and they have, they tree these coons and he'd come back and I'd ride my bike over his house and these, you know, things was 28, 29, 31 pounders, you know? Yeah. And I'd be just like amazed by that, you know. So I remember the first coon that my dog actually treed by itself, and I'd been kicked in the teeth. I, you know, I was, it was one of those deals. It's like I've hunted this dog all these nights. It's not treed a coon, and for some reason, maybe this was part of it. I did not take the rifle with me, and dog goes back. She just went right down the down this fence row came up treed which was weird i was like she's treed <laughs> yeah. i go up there i shine up the tree and there's a raccoon in the tree so i run I, I tie my dog up right there next to this bush and it run all the way back to the house probably quarter to half a mile grab the rifle run back to shoot that coon out of the tree and the whole time i come running in the house and mom's like what's wrong what's wrong it's like pearl tree to coon you know oh, yeah. and oh yeah you know so i'm grabbing my marlin rifle and i'm headed back out there and she's like don't run with a loaded gun oh yeah <laughs> yeah yeah absolutely absolutely yeah you know uh uh you know that uh talking about them brothers um so back then um you know the field trials and the water races was especially in, in our area uh, was probably bigger than the night hunts, honestly. And, um, you know, when I went, my very first kind of what I would have got introduced to the competitive side, didn't even know anything like that existed, but we actually went to a water race. Yeah. And, uh, and I remember, I don't even know where it was at. It, Ricky, uh, Dave's brother, Ricky took me. Uh, were Dave, you living in Northern Indiana or were you no, living No, no, this in was Wisconsin? still when I was in Wisconsin. Okay. 
And uh, Dave was uh, uh, Dave and, and Ron. Ron would go to uh, Ron would go to uh, a water race every now and then, but I don't ever recall Dave ever going to a, a, a field trial event or a water race or anything like that. But Rick, his, their youngest brother Ricky, did, and he wa- he asked me to go along one time, and I went. And that you know, of course, being uh, uh, I always would share with I always share with the people now, even then. Um, I was I wasn't a sore loser, but I was a very competitive person growing up as a kid, <laughs> to put it lightly. Uh, competed in everything that I did. Of course, we had horses, so you know, I was you know we you want to know who's got the fastest horse. So you know, it's you're racing. Absolutely. You know, you're racing. Yeah. It, you, you know, Sunday nights after church singings, we'd have a singing every Sunday night. At, you know, hour and, last hour and a half, and uh, we'd line them horses up and race home. I mean, that's just the way it was. And I remember vividly, uh, just a real funny story. Um, my dad was very competitive too, and so was my mom. So we got it honest. And uh, church got out one Sunday afternoon, and uh, dad had a horse he called Beauty. And I had a, a, a half sister to her called Cindy Lou. And uh, I got her when I was 16. Dad actually raised a foal a few years before that with the intent when I turned 16, that would be my horse. Yeah. And, um, and Beauty uh, should have been Mar- my older brother Martin's horse, but Martin didn't like her. Mm-hmm. And so. I don't even can't even remember what horse that Dad had got Martin for, but Cindy Lou was mine, and uh, I remember <laughs> vividly one one uh, Sunday afternoon, uh, Dad and Mom left church before I did on purpose, and because uh, I was going to pass him. Yeah. And uh, they had the double buggy, and here I have this single buggy. Of course, it's a seat, seater and a half they called it, and uh, we pull out of the church uh, or where we had church at. We pull out of the park or the driveway and go down the first stop sign and Cindy Lou always knew we, it was why it was the name of the road uh, you get to the top of the hill and there was about a probably a mile stretch that was all kind of downhill but you could see traffic for a long ways away and most of us that race that's the place that we yeah, raced well dra- buggy that, that's the buggy Amish drag you know, yeah. the Amish buggy drag and I remember coming up that hill and I mean I'm holding on for dear life because Cindy, Cindy Lou knew what was up and all of a sudden, I see the doors fly open on the double buggy, and the back window, your kind of a roll top window thing comes up, and and I realized right then and there that Dad was going to try to race <laughs> me, you know. And I'll never forget. I pull out to go around him, and Beauty was one of them that she was probably the fastest horse that we had, but she was one that if she wanted to race, she wanted to race, but most of the time she'd give up. Right. And that particular day, Dad had her. Dialed in. Dialed in, and down the road we went, and I'll never forget pulling beside him, and Mom just hitting Dad. Dad, knock it off. Dad, knock it off. Like that. Hey, he made it home before I did, and uh, that was talked for many years after that. So uh, being on that competitive side always, you know, that was kind of ingrained me, with me from young up. And uh, But I remember going to that uh, water race and watching them dogs compete. And uh, it, again, it just did. It was that first event that I went to, and I mean, there was probably you know back then. I'm gonna, I'm guessing, just roughly forty to fifty dogs at this water race. Yeah. And uh, it was a Saturday afternoon, and uh, I had to be home for chores that night. And uh, of course, R- Rick and them milked too, but they raced on. They they sw- swim ran, uh, raced these dogs, and uh, that's when my I started asking questions on you know yeah. that side of it. Now I never swam dogs like competitively. Uh, but that's where but it that, was something to do with it, dogs. It, it was something to do with yeah. dogs and just yeah. watching them compete. Yeah. And then, uh, uh, so yeah, so that's kind of when the competition thing was introduced to me. And then, um, the community that I lived in, uh, they wouldn't allow, uh, that would be something that they probably wouldn't allow. So I never really, I never competition hunted until I left home and moved to Indiana and, uh, moved in there with my uncle and aunt. And that's kind of when the competition thing yeah. uh, was where I kind of started doing that side of it. Well, man, we better wrap this one up. I got to put some miles in this afternoon. Absolutely. Absolutely. So what are you going to do with this podcast? Kind of give everybody an overview. Well, I, uh, uh, I'm really excited about this. You know, I, I we're going to, we're going to cover a lot of different things, uh, with people or whatever, but, um, everybody has a story. Um, and, uh, everybody, uh, cut their teeth from, you know, stories just the, like we told. Stories like we just just like yeah. we told. And uh, I've always been fascinated by that. And uh, you know, so we're we're gonna kind of get to the we're gonna kind of uh, we're gonna uh, sit down with people and just have regular conversations like this. 
of, you know, kind of their start. Um, we're going to do some on the competitive side because that's fun or whatever, but we're going to do more backdrops on who people really are and what really is a houndsman. You mm -hmm. know, I mean, what, what is, a, you know, what's the passion and the drive uh, that gets that person to do that? And, uh, you know, I know for me, uh, it has been such a huge part of my life. It's mm -hmm. introduced me to so many uh, good people. Uh, mm -hmm. And the more you got to know them, uh, the more you just, you had a lot of fun with them. So we're going to do a lot of that. We're going to get a lot of them stories. Really excited about that. Uh, we're going to dive into, you know, we're going to dive into some, some things on, uh, what, you know, what people's views is of, you know, where they see this headed, you yeah. know, and what, what has kept you a houndsman for 40 years or 30 years or 10 years, you know, uh, right. and that kind of thing. So, uh, kind of get the backdrop more of the, I guess you could say, uh, you know, you, most of most of them, not all of them, but most of them was a houndsman, a hunter, uh, long before they ever competed. So try to bring some of that out. So I'm excited yeah. about that. Yeah, it's going to be fun, and that's that's one thing that I'm really excited about you doing because you do have a knack for sitting back or sitting down with people and finding their story. You right. know, you know. We're, uh, we're going to, uh, we're going to kind of mix it up. We're going to go back from things that happened 30 years ago, uh, to current things. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, for me, my, in my twenties, uh, it was probably for me, absolutely love that era. Uh, I was very fortunate in that situation that I got to compete and travel all over the country and, uh, you know, got to hunt with a lot of these guys that are still winning today or are still hunting today. May not be even been competing as much. And uh, so we're going we're gonna to go through some of them stories. I'm really excited about that. Uh, you know, yeah. the people that we traveled together with and, you know, the, some of the things that went on and that kind of thing. So It's going to be fun. It, it's going to be a lot of fun. I'm looking really forward to it. I, I uh, uh, love having the opportunity. You know, I have, I've really enjoyed listening to uh, Josh Michaelis, you know, on the Truth Series. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, the one thing that I uh, love about what we can do is uh, I think that people can agree to disagree. And uh, I think it sharpens uh, people's skills. And I, I think that if we want to preserve the sport uh, of, of hound hunting, houndsmen, you know, uh, not just in the raccoon hunting, you know, into, you know, the, the, the squirrel hunting, the, the, the rabbit hunting, uh, that kind of thing. We're gonna cover. We're gonna cover some of that. I'm really excited about that as well. Uh, haven't done a lot of squirrel hunting, but I've done quite a bit of beagling, I guess you could call it. Right. And uh, so we're gonna dive into some of that because, uh, you know, a well, lot of this. You've got a big background. You you coyote hunted for a lot of years. Too. A lot of years. Uh, coyote hunted a lot. Yeah. And uh, hey, I got so hooked on it, Chris, that it almost replaced my coon hunt for a right. while. And. Right. Uh, you know, again, uh, just the thrill. It wasn't even as much. Uh, it wasn't for me. It's never been it, the thrill of the chase. Has always fascinated me watching that hound. You know, and if you get really down to it, and you talk to some of these guys, that's what it is for them too. Yeah. You know, and uh, you know, so so we're we're gonna obviously go through some of that uh, as well, and uh, you know, just just in general, uh, really the general purpose. Uh, uh, my passion for doing this or whatever is because it's our hope. I think it's all of our hope that we can educate uh, people along the way of what we really do and why, why we are passionate about it. And, uh, and we're going to work on debunking some of the myths of that, you know, houndsmen are hillbillies. And, well, uh, then what I'm hearing you saying is it's going to go from the truth about coon hunting. We're still, you're still going to dive deep in that. I know you are. Yeah. But we're going to tell the truth about being a houndsman. Being a houndsman. And, and in general. Yeah. Because I'll just put it out there. You know, I get a lot of messages about when are you going to talk about this or this breed of dog or this person or whatever. And, and I really enjoy all the feedback, but I think I haven't done a good enough job with the houndsman XP brand to say. This is about a lifestyle. This is about showcasing all of it and and trying to trying to make it mainstream. As a hunting community, as houndsmen, we have done a very good job of alienated alienating ourselves from the rest of the hunting world. That's why we don't have a say so at the table. 
when it comes to policy making time. That's why people think that what we're doing out there in the dark is, is they don't understand it. So they think we're up to no good. We're bringing it all out there. And with this podcast, we're capturing those people that had preconceived about ideas about houndsmen and setting the record straight with what being a houndsman really is. And that's why I'm excited about it's not just competition it's not just big game hunting it's not just coon hunting it's being a houndsman and and we're going to do that yeah and we're going to dive into a, a lot of the we're going to dive into a lot of the backdrop of you know uh what made a houndsman a houndsman and uh in general so mm-hmm. yeah uh, more it's going to be more than just raccoon hunting it, yeah. it's going to be we're going to do a wide variety of 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 uh a wide variety of the houndsmen in general. And I'm really excited about that. I, you know, I have friends of mine that I'm really good friends with that uh, have maybe raccoon hunted. They may go once in a while just to go. And, uh, but, you know, they have, uh, you know, they rabbit, you know, they enjoy running, you know, they enjoy beagling and, right. uh, and very passionate about it, you mm-hmm. know. So we're going to dive into, you know, we're going to dive into all kind of different hound hounds hound hunting so our focus is going to be on the coon hunting the truth about coon hunting and and houndsmen in that area but you're going to branch out to some of these other things absolutely yeah i can't have you moving in on my territory steve i still have a monday show that i talk about that stuff well here here's here's what i share with you uh here's what i figured out uh a lot of a lot of uh guys that raccoon hunt that's usually not the only thing that they hunt no and so uh, what we what we want to do is, uh, you know, what made this person a houndsman, you know, how he fell in love with it. But also what else, you know, what else, you know, th- there's a lot of them that have a, you know, a, a unique story aside from uh, raccoon hunting that we're going to cover. Oh, yeah. And uh, hey, some of them, I've been on some, you know, I've been on some hunts uh, that didn't have anything to do with a hound maybe in general that uh still have a lot of fond memories on so we'll touch a little bit on some of that too yeah good deal let's wrap this one up absolutely Thanks sounds for awesome tu- hey everybody needs to tune in when they see the through the truth pop up we're going to be running it every other week getting getting started getting steve's legs under him not overloading him and but i know how you are steve once you get rolling with this thing you're going to want to release one every day which we can't do but you're going to you're going to be moving on more regular i'm sure absolutely looking forward to it we're going to get uh we're going to do uh uh we've got some pretty exciting stuff uh, yeah. already planned uh coming up in the you know in the near future um and uh yeah we're going to we'll start it out probably uh every other week but uh, i really see that going to uh uh weekly uh pretty quickly yeah and uh, i do too you know, I just, uh, I'm excited. I'm excited to be able to reach out to some of these and uh, share their story. You got it. You know, absolutely. You got it. Well, thanks for tuning in, everybody. And Steve, thanks for jumping on board. I think you're going you're gonna really knock it out of the park with this. Looking forward to it. All right.